Fire might be the most common element in all of media. There isn't a fantasy game, movie, or world without a creature that could control fire in some way. And I'm not really surprised. Fire is an element known for its destructive nature. It only seems fitting that we give that power to mythical monsters like dragons. In this series, we'll be going over the biology and art of elemental powers, how to make them work, and how to make your creature stand out. As usual, we're gonna go about this in parts, with timestamps available for the speedrunners. Now, before we fire up our brains to create a creature, we should know what fire itself is. Fire is the visible result of a chemical reaction called combustion. This reaction requires three elements, fuel, oxygen, and heat, making up what we call the fire triangle. The basic premise is that heat heats the fuel to its ignition temperature, the ignited fuel then reacts with oxygen, which results in heat, repeating the cycle. If a single one isn't sufficient or present, then the fire simply dies. There are many types of combustion, but the major ones I'll be bouncing between are rapid combustion and explosive combustion. The difference between the two is that rapid combustion only results in heat and light, while explosions have the bonus of producing sound and a shockwave. Also note that the speed of combustion is dependent on the amount of oxygen in an area, so you can't really have fire in outer space. You might argue that the sun is on fire, but the sun isn't comparable to our earthly fire. It's a giant ball of gas that doesn't use chemical combustion, so it doesn't really need oxygen. Instead, it uses hydrogen to perform nuclear fusion at its core, the resulting heat and light spread out from the center towards the edges. So the sun isn't just a deadly laser. It's also the longest lasting atomic bomb that life on our planet has relied on for billions of years. But I'm getting off track here. How would our creatures generate flames in the first place? There are many glands we can modify to generate fire. Salivary glands, sweat glands, the crop found in birds, mucus glands, and even anal glands like that in a skunk. As long as they have a way to produce and store a chemical along with a way to ignite or catalyze it, and a way to release the resulting flame, then you're good to go. If you're wondering why production can't go straight to catalyzation, ignition, or release, it's because creating a substance is expensive and isn't an instantaneous process. Some chemicals also need to be pressurized, so having a reservoir ready to go in dire situations is critical. How to Train Your Dragon for all its fantasy had one realistic detail I really liked, and that's the inclusion of shot limits. It makes encounters much more tense, tests your abilities as a world builder to not over rely on flashy moves, and makes each shot count for both the creature and the story. Their fuel source doesn't necessarily need to be created by the creature as well. It can be a result of their diet, like Glavinus from Monster Hunter breathing fire by heating metal particles it's ingested from its tail. It can also be the result of symbiosis, like the Brachdeos and its explosive slime mold. Also, the fuel and its resulting blast need not always be liquid or gas. Solid materials can also be a good fuel source that can add variety. It also doesn't need to be an existing chemical. This is fantasy, people. Go make things up. Now, how would our creatures actually use the glands we've modified? Well, in my years of experience, <laughs> I can think of three ways. Instant ignition, spark shots, and chemical combination. Chemical combination, as its name implies, is the mixing of two or more chemicals to generate a flame. This method has two categories, internal and environmental. Internal combination is where all the chemicals needed for a fire are stored within the creature and are combined inside or outside of it. Luckily, we have a real-life example of such a weapon, and I know that some long-time creature designers will recognize this animal's prominence in explaining dragon anatomy, the bombardier beetle. This insect is a far cry from the giant flying reptiles that we're used to, but it's an important point of reference nonetheless. The beetle has two glands that produce hydrogen peroxide, a well-known antiseptic, and hydroquinone, a chemical mainly used in skin bleaching creams. Both chemicals are stored within a reservoir. When combined, they do nothing, but these reservoirs have vents that connect to a reaction chamber, where a third ingredient is introduced. The reaction chamber contains glands that produce catalyzing enzymes, catalase, which promotes oxygen release from hydrogen peroxide, and peroxidase, which catalyzes the oxidation of hydroquinones into quinones by using the oxygen from earlier. Quinones by themselves can irritate exposed tissue, but the bombardier beetle takes it one step further. The catalyzation process is exothermic, meaning it releases heat, so the spray isn't just irritating, it burns as well, with the spray reaching 100 degrees Celsius or 214 degrees Fahrenheit, which is as hot as boiling water, producing steam as it comes into contact with objects. This heat and the oxygen from earlier build pressure in the chamber to release the spray at 22 miles per hour. The strength and effects vary among species, but they all follow the same gland organization of production, storage, catalyzation, and release. This mechanism is present in dragon designs like the Hungarian Horntail from Harry Potter, 
It has two visible vents inside of its mouth to release chemicals, and likely has two glands that produce vastly different chemicals that react violently with each other. And compared to the bombardier, it forgoes catalyzation and mixes the chemicals directly, using its mouth like a crude reaction chamber. Depending on how you want the breath attack to look and how you want your creature to be defeated or utilized, you can choose between an internal or external combination. But if too many chemicals seems too fancy, then you can opt for environmental combination instead. Your creature only needs to store one substance that would ignite with whatever is in the area, like reactive rocks, chemical-rich plants, other monster substances, or even the air itself. Rattalos from Monster Hunter and the Death Grippers from How to Train Your Dragon have a powder and an acid respectively that ignite when in contact with the air, and as the Death Grippers have shown, your chemical need not be single-purpose or harmless. Add some variation. Just because a chemical isn't flammable by itself doesn't mean it can't mess you up. There are many real-life examples in the form of birds, minus a fire. Turkey vultures vomit strong stomach acid at up to 10 feet, along with partially digested meat, to deter threats. Fulmar chicks do the same, but with a foul-smelling, oil-rich substance that prevents predatory birds from flying by gluing their feathers together. Finally, the spitting cobra, which isn't a bird, as their name suggests, can't only inject their venom, they can also spit it into your eyes with blinding accuracy. To blind you. Should I keep that in? The script. What the fuck was I thinking? But maybe chemistry isn't your strong suit. That's where spark shots come in. One substance is expelled or built up and then ignited without using a chemical. And despite both categories of this method utilizing electricity, I've divided them based on execution, mechanical, and electrical. Starting with mechanical, the best example would be a flamethrower, of which there are two kinds. Gas flamethrowers, which expel gas using the gas's own pressure and ignited at the exit of the barrel, and liquid flamethrowers, which use a separate pressurized gas tank to propel the liquid, which is ignited in an ignition chamber behind the exit of the gun. Despite their artificial origins, both are incredibly similar to a bombardier beetle's anatomy. Production, storage, catalyzation, and release. Minus the production, another major difference is instead of catalyzation, their fuel is ignited through piezo ignition. Piezo ignition relies on the principle of piezoelectricity, where the accumulated electrical charge in some materials is released in response to mechanical deformation, which is just scientists talk for getting hit. Lighters, stoves, and flint and steel work just like this by utilizing quartz, a strong piezoelectric material. Creatures using this method should incorporate minerals into their body parts, like teeth, and beaks, or claws, to ignite their respective fuel sources. The Theostra from Monster Hunter, with its diet of ore and coal, coats its wings in gunpowder that it spreads in an area or breathes out in a stream, which it ignites by gnashing its teeth, just like a lighter. If lighters were 20-foot tall lion dragons, but what if your creature doesn't have access to a lot of minerals, or maybe it just doesn't have the equipment to eat a lot of them? Then you can choose electrical ignition and use electricity directly. But bioelectricity is for another video, so I'll just tell you it's basically mechanical ignition, but instead of using minerals to create electricity, they generate it naturally by using glands called electrocytes. It doesn't need to be powerful, just enough energy discharge to heat the air or the substance itself to its ignition temperature. Toothless and the hideous Zippelback from How to Train Your Dragon utilize this method, building up acetylene and ammonium nitrate mixed with hydrazine, respectively. The zipple back ignites with obvious sparks compared to Toothless, which is a lot more subtle. Spark shots also have the added benefit of adding drama to a scene, like with the zipple back's gas and the Theostra's embers, so ignition need not be instantaneous. But what if you want it to be? I know that instant ignition is vague, but my criteria for this is that it doesn't need a secondary source like chemicals, environmental temperature, or a sparking apparatus to start a fire. Though this is only achievable through a substance's auto-ignition temperature, the temperature at which substances ignite in the air without an ignition source. This can only be done by expelling a substance so fast that it generates enough heat to ignite itself. A creature would require a gland that can handle the pressure of storing and releasing something incredibly quickly, while also having the capability to expel it at those speeds. There aren't any examples I can think of in real life and fantasy, so it's best to make up some crackhead science for this. Insulation against fire is often relegated as a defense against predators that use it, often forgetting that fire burns all, predator and prey alike. Fire affects biological matter, damaging the skin's protective barrier, allowing bacteria to enter, disrupting cell assembly, and denaturing proteins. Being fireproof isn't simply the work of one component, but of many, which I've listed out here. 
Before moving on, fire resistant materials and fire retardants are incredibly different. Resistant is to make it difficult for fire to start or spread, and typically doesn't melt when exposed to heat. Retardants are to slow the spread of or extinguish existing flames. So fire resistance is more likely to be armor, while retardants are more versatile. With that said, fire resistant shields are your first line of defense. These typically exist in the form of thick armor. Inorganic materials such as rocks, dirt, metal, etc. work well for this purpose. Your creatures could manipulate the environment to create barriers, wear the materials as a coat or incorporate the minerals themselves into their bodily structures. Real-life vertebrates incorporate calcium into their bones and enamel, which is 85% mineral and is the hardest substance in vertebrates, for the outer layer of their teeth. Sharks use enamel as well, not only for their teeth but also for their scales. Finally, crustaceans and arthropods utilize chitin for their exoskeletons. Each is vastly different but still able to withstand high temperatures. One would think thick reptile scales would be equally useful but that's just not the case. Reptile scales are made of keratin, the same material as your hair and fingernails, which means it will burn just as easily. So fire-resistant armor isn't that fictitious. Natural metal armor isn't too far off from reality either. Volcano snails incorporate iron sulfides, which isn't pure iron so it's less conductive, into their shells and sclerite armor not for the heat but against predation. And despite their name, they don't live inside of volcanoes, but in the transition zone where the temperature ranges from 0 to 10 degrees Celsius. The main purpose of fire-resistant armor is to prevent direct contact with the skin and not outright negate heat. So it's best if the inorganic material isn't very conductive, like that of the volcano snails. Many fictitious fire creatures use this exact insulation method as well. Rodan from the Godzilla movies and the sea dragon Leviathan in Subnautica both incorporate inorganic material into their protective shells. But bulky armor may not be what you want. Fire retardants are important, since even a thin coating can decrease the chances of a burn. And unlike fire resistance, it can be armor and an attack to inhibit others from using fire in the first place. Fire retardants work by cutting off oxygen from a fire, a process well utilized by fire extinguishers in many forms, each with strengths and weaknesses as this chart shows. You don't need to be exact with your chemicals or adhere to the chart, but it's a good reference for specific creatures and could add variety to your creations. Also. Water may not be as effective as everything else on the list, but it's abundant and has the added benefit of cooling down an area to prevent fire reignition. Water also helps you cool down in the form of sweat, leading to our next insulation method. If your outsides are hot, it only makes sense to keep your insides cold. A study of echidnas found that during bushfires, they would purposefully lower their temperature to survive them. Echidnas typically have a body temperature between 28 and 35 degrees Celsius. However, in the study, Echidnas would decrease their metabolism by entering a state of torpor, which lowers their body temperature to 25.6 degrees Celsius. In this same study, only 1 out of 5 echidnas died due to them not being able to lower their body temperature fast enough. Another way of cooling down without being inactive would be to have a wider surface area compared to volume. Elephants are big, very big, and being that big makes it hard to cool off. So they evolved extremely wrinkly skin to retain water in between the folds and increase their surface area to cool off. They also have spaced out hairs that vary in density and the texture of the skin in different areas to cool off. You can also add thermal windows, regions of an animal's body surface that vary heat exchange with the environment, being opened or closed by changes in exposure and or blood flow. Some of these structures also increase the animal's surface area. Things like an elephant's ears, bat wings, cattle horns, giraffe patterns, and pink fairy armadillo plates all have blood vessels close to the surface, which they pump with blood to dissipate heat into the environment and then return cooler blood to the body. This is probably why dragons have both wings and horns. Lastly, a coating that doesn't negate fire, but instead heat can do wonders. It can be external heat like that of a fire in the environment or the creature's internal body heat. The Pompeii worm by itself can tolerate 55 degrees Celsius or 131 degrees Fahrenheit, but its fur coat, which is actually made of bacteria colonies, redistributes heat and keeps it cool in waters that can reach 105 degrees Celsius or 221 degrees Fahrenheit. But bacteria might be too gross for you though, so let's go back to the basic stuff. Water cools us down through evaporative cooling, where a surface is cooled as water evaporates from it. This is why many animals pant. The rapid breathing motion causes the production of saliva, which evaporates. Exhalation and nasal secretions help further this process. But that's not the only thing liquids can do. The light and frost effect occurs when a liquid comes into contact with a surface much hotter than its boiling point. The liquid undergoes rapid evaporation, creating a protective vapor barrier that reduces heat transfer and insulates it from direct contact to the surface. Which is why we can do stuff like this and, you know, not die. This is possible with many liquids, not just water, and is the reason why having even a thin layer of fire retardant could help. Though I'm not sure it applies to fire, so go research a bit more. 
Alright, lightning round. Distance is pretty self-explanatory. The further you are from fire, the safer, with some fire wielders likely combining or igniting their fuel at a good distance away from them, especially from delicate organs like their eyes. So I also recommend something like crystallized eye scales or a third eyelid for some extra protection. Valves refer to the openings in each of the glands that separate them from one another, to prevent the ignited substance from going back into the reservoir and blowing up the creature. Bombardier beetles have these vents in the reaction chamber that close when pressure builds up as the chemicals react, preventing self-destruction. Intervals are the amount of time between shots fired. A constant stream can exhaust a creature's fuel and fire retardant supply quite easily. It can also build up heat way quicker than the creature can handle. The bombardier beetle spray is not continuous, but a series of explosions in quick succession that help the beetle cool down just enough before the next spray, spraying between 368 and 735 pulses every second. Lastly, this one isn't protection against fire itself, instead it's byproduct, smoke. Most fire-related deaths are caused by smoke inhalation, not only in enclosed areas such as buildings, but also in open spaces, such as wildfires, if prominent enough. Your noses contain tiny hairs called cilia that sweep mucus from your nasal cavity into the back of your throat, where it can be swallowed and neutralized in your stomach. An exaggerated modification of these hairs would most likely do the trick. Alright, let's get to why they would evolve this in the first place and the pros and cons that come along with it. Despite us associating fire with carnivorous dragons, fire isn't that good at killing quickly, which isn't what you'd want if you're a hunter. And unless the fire is so hot it can melt metal, then you're not really getting anything, though it can be used as a means to drive out or herd prey. Firehawks in Australia, though not able to make fire, grab burning debris in bushfires and purposefully spread it to drive out hiding prey. It can also be used after a hunt to process meat like we do, and despite the the loss of nutrients, it has the added benefit of killing parasites and making the meat easier to digest. Other than that, fire adaptations are most likely to arise as a defense against predators, habitat manipulation, and sexual selection. Predatory defense is self-explanatory. Environmental manipulation means things like keeping warm or using it to change the environment like clearing brush for a territory. But you may be confused with sexual selection. Well, the strength and vibrancy of a flame can showcase a creature's health, like Charizard's tail. It could mean that the individual is strong and has enough resources to maintain such an expensive weapon, making it the perfect mate. The pros of this adaptation are obvious. Having a weapon like this ensures most things are going to steer clear of you and certain weather like snowstorms aren't as devastating. But that's all I can think of really. The cons on the other hand outweigh the pros. First and foremost, having a gas tank inside your body may not be the best thing to have if you want to survive. Internal chemical combination won't always have this problem. Like the bombardier beetle, the chemicals are separated just enough. But even one wrong move with environmental combination could mean death. A quick but gruesome one. Secondly, it's flashy. Very flashy. It doesn't matter if you're a predator or prey. Giving away your position isn't something you'd want. Granted, you can go the same route as poison dart frogs and showcase the danger of your creature with bright colors, but I'm not focusing on design right now. Third, if it's used as a hunting method as I mentioned earlier, you won't be getting much out of it. There's even the chance you can completely burn your prey if the temperature is high enough. Fourth, the impact on the environment. Forest fires are part of a beneficial natural cycle that happens under very specific conditions. So having a creature that can start that cycle prematurely can cause a habitat that relied so heavily on fire to die from it. Lastly, evolving fire isn't too plausible. Chemical weapons are a norm, yes, but what's the possibility of also evolving a sparking apparatus? Also, what's the survival rate of the ones that do evolve an internal bomb to spew out fire? But in the end, fire is a complicated weapon and I'm not here to tell you that you can't add them to your world just because they aren't that likely to happen in ours, or you need to follow the generation methods to the letter. Not everything you make needs to be realistic. We are artists first and scientists second. I'm just here to compile data to help you diversify your creations. With that said, take this data with a grain of salt. It could be wrong, lacking, maybe even downright stupid. So if you have certain things you'd like to add, clarify, or better explain, please do so in the comments. I'm hoping to learn a thing or two from you guys as well. Also, if you're wondering where the design part of this video is, there's going to be a part 2 since this one is already way too long. Keep a lookout for that one as well since I'm gonna cover things like underwater fires and different fire colors. So I hope you've learned something and best of luck out there. Have some bloopers on the way out. But before we get to those bloopers, I'd like to thank everyone who's watched my video and subscribed because I did not expect going from 42 subscribers to whatever the number is right now. I'm gonna see that later when I edit, but thank you everyone, especially the people who've commented from the supportive comments to criticisms about my video and my creature and the crab cult that was slowly growing in the comment section. I appreciate all of you. This video took a while to make, so I hope you like it. And if you do have any questions or, you know, criticisms, comment section is always open. Again, thank you, and here are the bloopers if you want to watch to generate fire.
the Leverigana, and even anal glands like that in a skunk. Why did I emphasize anal? <laughs> this method, this method, both chemicals are gen both chemicals are mixed inside of a reservoir, <laughs> using the chemicals like a crude reaction chamber. Did I say chemicals? Both categories of this method. Mm. Both methods of this category. What the fuck? Their artificial or origin. Difference is instead of. I bit my tongue. Piezo ignition relies on the principle of piezo electric. There's so much peas in this. Sh Maybe it just doesn't have the ex the exhibit. Just enough energy discharge. Just just enough. Just enough energy discharge. Discharge. So many words. Discharge. I can see it naturally there. What the heck? The temperature at which substances ignite in the ignite. <laughs> the temperature at which substances ignite in the air. In the air. Retardants are to slow the spread or ah, or extinguish existing. <laughs> fire resistant shields. Hey. Fire resistant. <laughs> fire resistant. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Many vertebrates incorporate calcium. Calcium. Their shells and scleret iron. anymore. Volcano shell. Volcano shells. Like that of the volcano. So it's best if the er <laughs> But a series of explosions in quick succession. But a series of explosions in quick succession. But a series of explosions in quick succession.